In honor of Black History Month, uh, we are going to talk about March, uh, the first book by Congressman John Lewis. It is a graphic memoir um, of John Lewis's life as a social activist from his childhood until uh, college. So it is the first of three books, so there's a uh, book two and three. Um, they're all black and white, and kind of in the vein of like Mouse or Persepolis, which are also like black and white biographical um, comics. So it's not super in depth. He's just picking like pr particular like standout moments in his life um, related to the civil rights movement. Um, it's just like personal account. Somebody who was invested and participated in the movement um, in the 50s and 60s. In this particular uh, time period being like the 50s and 60s. Um, I liked it Mo mostly I think because it really people tend to think of like a lot of you know civil rights heroes there's like huge figures but since he starts from his childhood and he talks about like meeting some of the, the people who most people consider huge figures just kind of just show you how just the everyday normal person can become a hero, you know, by doing, like, small things, things that are small to them, like, personal to them, but it make big impacts, like, for a lot of people. So it's a very um, engaging book, uh, it's easy to read, it has really nice illustrations, and I would say it's great for anybody who um, likes biographies, who is into history, um, or who wants to know more about the civil rights movement. So that's the short, the short version. Next up, we'll go into spoiler reviews, and at the end, you'll be able to see some uh, read likes. All right, welcome to the spoiler review for March Book One. So the book itself is uh, starts off in the present. The present being when uh, the day of Ana Obama's inauguration. So, John Lewis is in his office at Congress, and some kids um, are coming by to do a tour, and he is telling them, uh, like, his story of how he got involved in the civil rights movement. So, that's kind of the, the beginnings of the story. And he talks about himself when he was a kid. He, um, he grew up in Alabama. His father was a sharecropper. In the 40s, um, they lived in a very rural area, very poor area. Um, and as a kid, he wanted to be a preacher. He liked to practice uh, preaching to the chickens. <laughs> um, he also really liked school. Um, he would have to catch the school bus some days, some days uh, avoiding his dad um, and sneaking on to the bus to go to school because some days they would need him to stay home from school so like he could help with the farming. I did notice like a big contrast he said between like his school, the quality of his school and the quality of the school for the white people in town. Like their school they had old buses, old textbooks, they didn't have a play yard, their buildings were like just old buildings and in the white part of town, they had paved roads and and um, like a nice school building and play equipment and that kind of stuff. So even when I was a kid, um, he picked up on that. And also f for the first time, he went north as a kid, which actually is a it's he went up north in a car trip um, with his uncle, which seems to be like a pretty prevalent, I guess, thing that happened. I didn't realize that happened back in the day because like uh, the Birmingham 1966 book I believe that's what it's called um, is a story that way about a family traveling from the south to the north by car which I make sense everybody traveled by car by then if you had a car um, but the kind of like traveling from north I mean from south to north dealing with um, a lot of like racism and fear about traveling in the south 
the southern parts of the state. Like, he talked about how his uncle, like, knew they couldn't stop certain places and stuff like that because it wasn't safe. And then he didn't really feel um, any safe until he got into the northern states. But also, he, his uncle lived in Buffalo, New York, so he was very surprised. He said that his uncle had, like, white neighbors. I guess that's the first time he saw, like, an integrated like, neighborhood. But he said his uncle had white neighbors on both sides, so he was like... And he lived, like, in the city, so as compared to, like, the very rural area that they lived in. So, it was very different for him, like, you know, going in the supermarket and, you know having uh, neighbors of different colors, stuff like that, so, um, so it's a very, you know, a very, very different life from, like, his rural life, that was a much more segregated, um, when he got older, he still wanted to be a preacher, when he's a teenager, um, he decided to go to a seminary school, his, somebody that his mom worked for, uh, had connection to a seminary school, so they suggested maybe he could go there. They paid for his school, and he could get like a um, a work study job. So he did go to a seminary school that was just for black students, although it was like um, co-sponsored by like, the white and ba black Baptist churches. And he went there for a while, but also as he was growing up, he explains that he heard a lot of what he called the. Uh, the social gospel, which was uh, like, like people like well, well, it was specific. He does specifically mention Martin Luther King, so like Martin Luther King talking about like social justice and civil rights and things through the radio. He heard a lot about um, like Brown versus um, Brown versus Board of Education, the Emmett Till case, about Rosa Parks, all that through the radio as he was growing up. And so once he got older, even though he wanted to be a preacher, he wanted to be involved in, you know, civil rights movement and preaching social gospel, not just, you know, regular, you know, church stuff, I guess you could say. He wanted to be involved in the civil rights movement. So he decided that he would try to transfer to the local all-white college in, in his town, which is Troy College. So he applied. They said no. Well, they didn't really say no. They just more like didn't say anything. And so he decided he would, he said specifically he decided to write a letter to somebody he thought would understand his situation, which was Martin Luther King. So he just wrote a letter to Martin Luther King. He told him that he was trying to you know, apply to the Troy College and then as a transfer student and it was all with college and they weren't, you know, responding. And he actually got a response back from him, physically um, from, let's see, from Fred Gray, who was a lawyer who was working with Martin Luther King, who represented Rosa Parks. And also from uh, Reverend Ralph Abernathy. They set up meetings with him and talked to him about what he was, uh, you know, what he wanted to do. They eventually set him up with a meeting with MLK right there. An actual meeting. So if you think about it, like, this was just, like, a random kid who lived in, like, a rural part of Alabama. Hadn't really ever been out of it except for, it sounds like the one time maybe he went up to visit Uncle Samore. But just a, you know, just a normal college student. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to write to that Martin Luther King. <laughs> and, and they would talk to him. They told, you know, they told him, he, he got a meeting. They said, okay, if you, you know, you seem like a good kid. And if this is what you really want to do, we can help you with it. You will have to go to court. It will be very dangerous. They do have specifically, like, you know, he says, your parents could lose their jobs, your families could be bombed or burned. Like, you need to talk it over with your family. And since he was still, I believe they said he was still uh, 
17, then he has to get his parents' permission to do it. Right? But and he talks about he wanted to do it, but his parents, they were too scared. But should, and so they told him no. So he wasn't able, you know, to go on and do it. Which he was, he was very sad about, which I could totally understand. Um, he actually did, there was a little part about it, but they did talk about when he was talking about MLK and about this. And even later on, he talks a little bit about how, like, with the, with the students that he got involved in, how, like, the older generation were a lot more fearful and didn't want to push as much as, like, which it's weird to think of, like, MLK as the younger generation, but as, like, the college student and, um, that age range did. Like, the, and for him, like, so, like, the traditional black leadership and in double ACP and things like that, they were too conservative for them. And the college students, the younger people, were the ones who were, they wanted to, you know, they were willing to cause unrest, I guess, to, to bring light to what was going on, right? So they talk about that, um, he talks about that a lot more. So even though he, he was still, he couldn't transfer to Troy State, he's still interested in, you know, the civil rights movement, so making social change. So he ended up going to a workshop led by a graduate student, a divinity graduate student named Jim Lawson where he trained them in nonviolent protesting, you know, you know, in the way of Gandhi, so nonviolent protesting. So, and they did, they practiced, they actually showed them they practiced doing it. So they practiced screaming at each other, cuss words, racial slurs, um, spitting on each other, throwing stuff, like knocking each other down, that kind of stuff so that they, so when it happened in real life, that they would be able to hold their temper, because the idea of being is non-violent, you're showing that, you know, you're there, you're protesting, the idea of this is, you know, for them, they were planning on doing, like, sit-ins at diners, so that they'll go into a diner, order something, or try to order something, they're a legitimate customer, and then they, they're sitting, so they did a couple practice ones, where they just went in, order something, the person said no, they said for like a minute or two, and then they got all got up and left. And the the protesters themselves, of course, they were they're college students, but they're also, you know, it's uh, students of different races and genders and things like that. But they were all um, interested in doing that. So in, for him in particular, he um, participated in sit-ins in Nashville. And they got kind of word went around pretty quickly once they started doing them and they got a lot more volunteers involved and the police got involved and some counter protesters got involved and like the longer they went on with it like at some at one point the police were just kind of like telling them don't show up or maybe we won't do anything if the counter protesters like show up kind of thing but they did anyway eventually the so they're getting I mean they got arrested they got thrown in jail for a while the judge was not obviously if you read the book the judge is very biased toward them he's won't let them have a judicial child not trying to hear their case at all like he was just thrown in there, right? So the mayor eventually agreed to, like, some integrated lunch counters. The book itself ends. Yeah, kind of on that end. Like, so they had, in, you know, in a victory in their local town is where it ends. But, of course, that's just, like, a big... A beginning step. You got two more books after that one. Just in his 
history. But this is pretty much the early history. I feel like with this book, it's more... It will introduce you to some organizations and people that you would want to look more into. If that makes sense. So, like, when you hear, like, SNCC, right? Which is the student group that they end up forming. Because they felt like, the students felt like the NAACP was too conservative, so they formed their own student group that would run protests. Then, but I know that organization went on for a long time and did a lot of things, so that would kind of give you, like, a oh, here's this organization, but then you would want to go read more about it. Some of the people that he talks to, of course, you would want to go read more about them. But I, I like it still as kind of like a personal journey of like a young person. He's still young there, so it's like in his young life. How he got involved. Why he got involved. Like what his life was like and what led him into, and into it. And some of his early experiences. So that's what I would say about March. It's a good, it's a good, well, introduction to John Lewis, I guess, if you don't know anything about him, but also just a good introduction to the civil rights. That, that was, that's March, the first book. Uh, if you read it and you like it, definitely uh, check out the suggestions. I'm sure, coming up next.